as a psychologist, I am um, a former psychologist, now neuroscientist, I couldn't really give a talk in, in this city without mentioning this man, Sigmund Freud. Um, now, a lot of Freud's methods and theories have fallen out of favor in recent years with uh, the scientific community. But uh, the aim of his work, the, the thread that runs through all of his work, was in trying to develop a scientific understanding of the human mind and brain. And that's obviously something we're still working on, um, uh, myself and my colleagues. So nowadays, we use different methods to Freud. We use a lot more technology. And for, in my mind, the, the kind of modern era of, of brain imaging technology was started in 1973 by this man, Professor Terry Jones. And this is an image of his own brain. He made this in New York um, by lying inside a PET scanner, which is a big radiation detection device, and breathing in radioac radioactive oxygen. And the brain is very metabolically active. It consumes a lot of oxygen, so the oxygen accumulated in the brain and the radiation accumulated there as well. And you can see uh, an image of the brain on the PET camera. And the images are not very good, I think you'll agree, but still, this was the first image of a, a working brain still sitting in a human being. Uh, so it was a very important milestone. And nowadays we use PET scanning for a lot of different things, diagnosing diseases, uh, investigating drugs, and looking at brain neurochemistry, and it's improved a lot, as you can see. There's a big problem with PET scanning. Uh, it's very good for some things. It turns out not to be a very good functional brain measure. Um, one of the big problems is that you have to actually put radioactive stuff into people, which is usually something you want to avoid, if possible. Fortunately, uh, a new technology came along in the 1980s called MRI, and magnetic resonance imaging uses radio waves and big magnets to produce images of the inside of the body. And MRI turned out to be a very flexible technique. So this is an image of my own brain. It can produce really nice detailed images like this of the inside of the body. Uh, it can produce really nice different kinds of images of the wiring diagram of the white matter tracts of the brain. Uh, as used by Muse on the cover of one of their albums, Muse Rock. Uh, <laughs> and most importantly, uh, for my research, it, we can exploit it in a different way and use it to measure functional uh, brain uh, things. So we can see the brain working. We can see dynamic um, scans of the brain while subjects are doing something. And this little schematic of a, a functional MRI experiment um, shows a subject watching a visual image on the screen, and as the image appears, you can see activity in the visual cortex at the back of the brain there. And functional MRI came along in the kind of mid-90s. And um, when I started my research career in 1999, I started my PhD, uh, there was a big sense of excitement about this, this amazing new technology that was going to you know, maybe change everything. For the first time, we could really see inside people's heads, essentially. We could see the brain in action while people were doing things, and it was a very exciting time. And I determined that I was going to work with this technology, and I was lucky enough to get a job after my PhD doing that kind of thing, and I've been doing it ever since. And uh, most of my research now is focused on uh, drugs, various kinds of drugs, some, some pharmaceutical, some of the fun ones. <laughs> so I'm just going to share a couple of examples. So. This was a study that I did recently at uh, where I'm now employed at the Imanova Centre for Imaging Sciences with a couple of students who are up there. And um, we were interested in the effects of smoking. So there's been a lot of studies on nicotine, but all of those studies have used uh, nicotine patches or nicotine gum or injections. Um, and this is because hospitals really don't like you smoking cigarettes in their MRI scanners. <laughs> So the scanner fills up with smoke, uh, what happens if you drop it and set yourself on fire, those kinds of things. These are the kinds of things that health and safety people worry about, and they don't let us do it. So we had an idea about a year ago and said, well, okay, why don't we try it with e-cigarettes? These little devices that are battery-powered, they produce this nicotine vapor, very safe, very nice. So we did. And uh, the, the most uh, powerful result that we got, the, the biggest result we got, is circled in green on the screen there, and it's in the, uh, the left motor cortex. The motor cortex is the part of the brain responsible for controlling your body movements. And uh, what this shows for the first time, it was very exciting, is that when people are smoking cigarettes, they tend to move their right hand quite a lot. No? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> More exciting than that was actually the, 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 the areas that we saw highlighted in blue there. Uh, and this is, these are areas in the middle of the brain. They're very rich in a, a neurotransmitter called dopamine. 
and they are uh, involved in processes like addiction and reward. And so what this suggests is that people find the act of smoking itself rewarding independently of the effect of nicotine, and that's something we hadn't seen before. Uh, another fun one that I've done recently was uh, looking at the effects of different strains of cannabis. So in cannabis, there are a lot of dif different uh, psychoactive chemicals, and two of the big ones are tetrahydrocannabinol, or THC, and cannabidiol, or CBD. And THC is more often associated with negative effects of cannabis, anxiety, paranoia, addiction, maybe even cannabis-induced psychosis, whereas CBD might be one of the more helpful compounds in cannabis. It's actually anti-anxiety, might be helpful for pain management and things like that. The problem is that a lot of modern strains of cannabis have been bred to give very high levels of THC. Uh, and this is because it gives you a very strong effect. It makes you feel really stoned. <laughs> um, so we're interested in looking at whether uh, the, the other chemicals in cannabis, particularly CBD, can insulate the user against the, the negative effects of THC. So we tested these two different strains of cannabis, one that was pure THC and one that was THC and CBD, and looked at a set of standard networks. And in some of them, we saw effects of both. So in the top one there, the default mode network, you can see that there are comparable effects of both, fairly, fairly comparable. Uh, but in some of the networks, we found quite a strong difference in that the, the THC was affecting it, but the THC plus CBD wasn't. So it seems like the CBD was uh, having some effect there. Uh, and particularly in this salience network, uh, the areas at the front there are very involved in kind of higher cognitive processes like uh, attention and working memory. And this fits quite well with the kind of um, uh, effects you get of cannabis, working memory problems. And this study was done at UCL with uh, David Nutt, Val Cameron, and Rebecca Pope there. So, like Professor Terry Jones, uh, who produced the first pet image, I'm a big believer in not asking my subjects to do something that I wouldn't be prepared to do myself. So, this is me inhaling a big bag of cannabis vapor before going in on MRI scanning. <laughs> and completely legal, I promise. All done under a license. Um, and this is me after... Uh, <laughs> having a dose of uh, psilocybin, which is the hallucinogenic ingredient in magic mushrooms. Uh, that's a whole other story, though. So that's, that's the kind of thing that I do with, with fMRI. Um, but other people have been really pushing the technology forward and, and developing new techniques. And that's what I want to talk about for the rest of the talk. Uh, so particularly a, a guy called Jack Gallant at uh, UC Berkeley. And they did a beautiful study a few years ago where they just had people watching movies in the MRI scanner. And they then categorized those movies according to what was on the screen. So whether it was a person, a, a, a table, a car, a building, a road, whatever. And they came up with these 1,785 distinct categories. And they mapped those according to the brain response that they got. So they mapped the surface of the brain according to which res what areas of the brain responded to which category. And produced this beautiful, highly detailed map of the underside of the brain. And probably the most detailed map of this kind of thing that we've got so far. So that was very cool. Actually, what they did next was much cooler. So they flipped it around, flipped the whole idea around, and said, OK, we've, now we've got this map. We know how the brain responds to these categories. Can we, rather than showing people images and recording the brain response, can we record the brain response and then try and tell what people were watching while they were in the scanner? Does that make sense? And, in fact, they went a step further than that, and they actually reconstructed the video clips from the brain activity. So, on the top row here, you have stills from the video clips that they were seeing, and on the bottom row, you have the algorithm's best guess from their brain activity as to what they were seeing at the time. And, as you can see, it's, it's pretty good. It's not bad. It does okay. Yeah, okay, they're a bit fuzzy and nasty, but, generally, it, it gets the idea. And... This is very exciting, because what you're doing here is you're using an external piece of technology, an MRI scanner, um, in some sense, in, in a limited sense, to read people's minds. You're reconstructing an element of their interior consciousness using an MRI scanner. And this technique has been expanded uh, to lots of different things. So people have tried it with emotions. So we can tell um, with a reasonable chance um, what emotions people were feeling at the time the data was recorded purely from their brain activity. 
people have done it with pain, so we can tell how much pain people were in at the time of the scan. So, does this mean that an MRI scanner is a mind-reading device? Kind of, yeah, in a, in a limited, special sense. But I think what it does demonstrate is that a mind-reading device should be probably possible. Uh, and that's very exciting, because people have been thinking about what a mind-reading device might do for a long time. So if we had a really good general-purpose mind-reading device, um, we could do all kinds of things with it. We could uh, modify people's memories, like Arnold in uh, Total Recall, another famous Austrian, right? Um, we could uh, know Kung Fu instantly, like Keanu. We could uh, meddle with people's dreams, like Leonardo in Inception. And we could maybe, possibly, even upload our consciousness to a computer, like Johnny Depp in this terrible, terrible movie from last year. <laughs> Don't go and see it. But... Um, as far as we know, there's nothing that we found out at, about the brain that says that any of these things won't be possible. It's just we don't have the right tools to do it at the moment. So where are we with the technology? One good way of thinking about uh, brain imaging technology is a combination of spatial resolution and temporal resolution. So spatial resolution meaning how finely we can slice up the brain, and temporal resolution meaning how fast can we do it? How fast can we record data? So there are techniques like uh, electroencephalography and magnetoencephalography, don't worry about that, um, <laughs> that have really good temporal resolution on the millisecond scale, but fairly poor spatial resolution. Uh, PET that I've mentioned has slightly better spatial resolution, but much worse temporal resolution. fMRI kind of sits in the middle, which is partly why it's so popular. It has reasonable spatial resolution and pretty good temporal resolution. But the sweet spot, the place where we really want to be, is down here. We really want to be able to image the brain really fast at the millisecond or probably even sub-millisecond timescales, and we want to record uh, at the cellular level or maybe even lower at the molecular level. If we can do that, then all of these crazy sci-fi things may become possible. And it's not complete fiction. It's definitely going to be a massive technical challenge. Uh, there's 86 billion neurons in the human brain. That's the best estimate we currently have. Uh, about 100 trillion synapses. That's the one with 14 zeros after it. Uh, this is a really nice uh, illustration of, of the kind of complexity we're talking about. This is a, a tiny part of a mouse brain that was published a couple of months ago, um, where they've produced this beautiful 3D reconstruction showing this exploded view and all the different cell types and how they fit together. Uh, so all these different cells are really packed together in the brain, and we'd have to try and generate that spatial pattern and reconstruct everything exactly as it, as it is. It's also going to be a massive computational challenge. Uh, my lab generates hundreds of gigabytes of, of fMRI data every year, and if we were scanning it 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 times the resolution, the data would be just unmanageable. But fortunately, we have Moore's law on our side. So Moore's law says that computing power doubles roughly every two years. And people have made predictions about Moore's law uh, and saying that by 2015, we should be able to simulate a mouse brain. Yeah, we haven't quite got there. Um, 2025, we should be able to simulate a human brain. And by 2045, we should have enough computing power to simulate the brain of every human on the planet. IBM have simulated a 530 billion neuron network with 10 trillion synapses, which is pretty good. 10 trillion synapses, that's, that's about in the same ballpark as where we want to be in terms of the number of connections. Uh, unfortunately, it runs at 1,540 times slower than real life. <laughs> so, yeah. There are other really interesting recent developments. This was published just a couple of weeks ago. And this is the first time that we've seen real-time imaging of an entire organism. So this is the larva of a fruit fly, Drosophila, and it's, about, it's less than a millimeter, this animal. But what you're seeing in these animations is um, individual nerve cells firing. So they've managed to image the entire nervous system of an organism at cellular resolution in real time. And this is, this is really cool. Uh, if they can 
if they can scale this up to bigger organisms, and I imagine they're working on it already, uh, then we might, be, we might be in some serious business here. So given this massive complexity and all these challenges, um, you might think, well, why, why do we even bother? And sometimes I feel like that too. So sometimes I feel like being an fMRI researcher is, is a bit like trying to take apart a very delicate, intricate watch mechanism. Uh, when the sharpest tool that you have is a button, and you're wearing boxing gloves, and you're doing it in the dark. <laughs> um, but we have made a, a lot of progress in the last 40 years, um, and accurately characterizing the human brain down to the kind of levels that I've been talking about is a massive challenge. Uh, it, possibly the, the most difficult thing we'll ever try to do as a species. Um, for me, it's a huge privilege to be working on a, a tiny, tiny part of that very big problem. Uh, I think the next 40 years of brain imaging are going to be really exciting, and I hope I've managed to share some of my excitement with you today. Thank you very much.